Hello, um, my name is Emma Evans. I work in the team within the Welsh Government which has responsibility for the policy relating to the credit and qualifications framework for Wales, or the CQFW for short as we call it. I'd firstly like to thank UK NARIC for hosting this webinar for us today. One of the main reasons for delivering the webinar at this point in time is to promote the CQFW's links with other qualifications frameworks, particularly in Europe and how these support mobility to and from Wales, which is particularly important within the context of the UK's exit from the EU. I'll start with uh, providing an overview of the CQFW. So the CQFW is an all-inclusive framework which can recognise all forms of learning across all different levels. It was launched in 2003 and it has many, many benefits. Some examples are, it aims to give clarity on the qualification system in Wales, so it acts as a vehicle to describe our qualification system. It also offers parity esteem for qualifications. It supports the recognition of credit and qualifications. So credit provides a common currency for learning achievement and it makes it easier for a learner to articulate and communicate what they've achieved. It can help learners and others make informed decisions about their learning and see potential progression pathways into further learning. This may be from one level to the next or to different types of learning. And it can also help employers and learning providers understand what somebody has already achieved. So this is our uh, fan diagram. We'll start, we'll start with the Welsh version. It's available in both Welsh and English. So the CQFW has eight levels plus an entry level uh, for entry level qualifications. So the fan diagram um, illustrates these levels. So the higher the level, the more challenge, challenging the qualification or learning program is. So here is the English version of the fan diagram. So the fan diagram, as well as showing the different levels, which are shown in white at the bottom, it also provides some examples of different qualifications which can be available at each of the levels and the different types of learning provision that is also recognised within the CQFW. So the coloured bands illustrate the, the levels that each learning type is undertaken at. For example, the lilac band shows that school-based learning is undertaken from entry level up to level three. Higher education, which is shown in blue, shows that education at that level is available from levels four up to eight. Okay, the, the, the CQFW encompasses a wide range of qualifications, credit-based accredited training and non-accredited delivery. So it categorizes these qualifications and learning into three types and we call these pillars of learning. So it was a pillar of learning for higher education, regulated vocational and general qualifications, and also lifelong learning. The next visual here is our pillars diagram. Again, that's available uh, both in Welsh and in English. This is the Welsh version. And this provides an illustration of those three different pillars of learning. So the diagram uh, also offers some examples of the types of learning which may be recognized within each of the pillar, and also gives a bit more information such as where information on the learning may be found, types of delivery and awarding bodies, any underpinning standards and who provides oversight of learning within the pillar. So this is our English version. So again, it displays each of the three pillars and there's the rows within each to provide a little bit more information on each. So if we look at the, the blue pillar, the blue section in the top left hand corner, this is higher education. And this recognises qualifications such as HNCs, HNDs, degrees, postgraduate certificates, masters, etc. The Higher Education Funding, the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales oversees the Higher Education Pillar, the CQFW. In Lilac, we have the Regulated Qualifications Pillar, and this recognises all regulated vocational and general qualifications. So this may be things like our GCSEs, A or AS levels the Welsh Baccalaureate and vocational qualifications. At the bottom of the diagram shown in orange is our lifelong learning pillar. So the CQFW all supports, also supports lifelong learning and progression via routes which are not necessarily defined by academic and vocational education. Lifelong learning allows people to learn flexibly at any point during their lifetime and at times and places that suit their needs rather than more traditional means of being taught in a classroom. Some examples may be adult and community learning, 
company, employer learning and voluntary sector learning. I'll give you a little bit more information on the uh, lifelong learning pillar. So the lifelong learning pillar allows for the recognition of qualifications which sit outside of higher education and the regulated qualifications pillars. So for example, courses which may result in certificates of attendance. So the CQFW acknowledges that lifelong learning takes place and should be valued and recognised. There is no central regulatory process for the lifelong learning. Historically, the Welsh Government did hold a register of accredited units, uh, also known as non-formal learning. Back in 2014, the Welsh Government commissioned an independent stakeholder review of the CQFW. The review noted that there were concerns about the bureaucracy and time taken for the recognition of these smaller accredited units of learnings and also the onus requirements that were put on centres. Our then Minister for Education and Skills accepted the recommendation in the review to move ownership of the lifelong learning pillar back to the sector in an attempt to make lifelong learning less bureaucratic and more accessible. So therefore, to summarise, quality assurance of lifelong learning is not overseen by the Welsh Government and is in line with developing organisations' own internal quality assurance processes. Our next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the lifelong learning pillar splits learning into two different types. Firstly, we recognise vendor, industry and professional learning. So this is learning which tends to be stipulated by employees who require their workforce to undertake sector or industry specific training as part of their ongoing professional development. And it includes provisions such as vendor or professional courses. The other side of the lifelong learning pillar is unitized accredited learning. These are bespoke, tailored, bite-sized units or modules of learning which have a credit value. So unitized accredited learning can apply to many learning environments, such as in-house company training, adult and community learning, and voluntary, voluntary sector training. As it is form formally accredited, it must be developed by a higher education institution in Wales or a UK awarding body. So to summarise, the lifelong learning pillar gives flexibility for work-based work learning providers to design programmes to meet individual needs. So it allows employers who have specific learning needs, but don't necessarily require a full regulated qualification to create both bespoke training, which awards credit to the learner upon achievement. So I'll move on to tell you a little bit more about how uh, the governance of the CQFW is managed. So it's overseen by a strategic operational partnership. There are three partners to that. So we have the Welsh Government, the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales and Qualifications Wales. So Welsh Government maintains overall ownership of the CQFW CQF policy uh, and oversight of the CQFW and we coordinate activity and governance on behalf of the wider partnership. The Higher Education Funding Council for Wales, HEFQ, they oversee our higher education pillar and Qualifications Wales oversees the qualifications and the awarding bodies within the regulated qualifications pillar. And both Qualifications Wales and um, HEFQ are Welsh Government sponsored bodies. Okay. So uh, the partnership is uh, supported by an external stakeholder advisory group. The advisory group was established back in 2015. Again, it was one of the recommendations of the review that took place five years ago. And the aim of the advisory group is to ensure effective strategic development, promotion and implementation of the CQFW. It meets annually and it sets objectives and reviews and evaluates progress that we're making. Advisory group members also provide advice on the appropriateness, the value and the benefits of the CQ, CQFW and its alignment and dependency on other qualification frameworks. They also suggest improvements to the CQFW. So in order to be recognised within the CQFW, all learning, regardless of which pillar it falls within, must be developed in accordance with a set of eight high-level principles. So the slide here lists the high-level principles in summary, and I won't go into detail today, but more detail of it is available on our website and within the materials on that. <clears throat> so the CQFW maintains links with the other UK and Irish qualifications frameworks. It is also referenced to the European qualifications framework. 
We've recently undertaken a re-referencing exercise to ensure that this is up to date for when the UK exits the EU. And Adrian uh, will also talk about this in more detail shortly. So the, the independent stakeholder review of the CQFW that I mentioned before, which took place in 2014, uh, supported maintaining relationships with the other UK nations to ensure alignment across the UK and Europe, and also continued alignment between the CQFW and the European Qualifications Framework. Alignment with these frameworks offers transferability and mobility for learners and ensures that qualifications can be compared and recognised. The CQFW also maintains links to the framework for higher education qualifications in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And this is a really important reference point for higher education providers. So due to the devolved nature of education and training policy in the UK, the EU vocational education and training national coordination points were established to implement European qualifications framework and associated initiatives across each of the four UK administrations. So Colleges Wales acts on behalf of the Welsh Government as the national coordination point in Wales for the European qualifications framework, the EQF, the European credit system for vocational education and training, known as ECVET, and the European Quality Assurance and Vocational Education and Training, known as Equivet. So, as I mentioned, Colleges Wales acts as the Wales National Coordination Point. In England, it's represented by Ofqual. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the Council for Curriculum Examinations and Assessment, SIA, uh, manage that. And in Scotland, uh, it's overseen uh, by the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework Partnership. And all the national coordination points act in an advisory capacity to in inform uh, officials within the governments and, and ministers. So I'd like to hand over at this point to Adrian. Adrian uh, works for Colleges Wales and is our uh, um, EQF uh, expert and he's going to give you a little bit more information around each of the initiatives in the European framework. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Adrian Sheehan, and I'd like, as Emma said, to give a bit more detail about the links that exist between CQFW and the other qualification systems and, and how the links work. Um, I think it's worth, it's worth saying that um, all of this has got to do with um, improving mobility of, of people. Um, because the ability of people to move between institutions, um, between jobs, and to do this across different countries is, is an important part of, of all developed economies. Um, I mean, it's very much in the news at the mo and under discussion at the moment with immigration, with, with ma economic migrants, with, with, with how we deal with refugees, for example. Um, and it's one of the central ideas behind uh, the European Union and how the European Union works. But I must say, it's, it's not exclusive to the EU. Um, this idea of free movement of goods, services and people, or as free as possible, is going to continue, I think, whatever happens uh, in e uh, sort of UK-EU negotiations over the, over the next few months. Um, the links between qualification frameworks um, is important in terms of promoting education and training by creating links between different qualifications and, and countries and making comparing qualifications easier. It's going to help people who are moving either between countries or be, uh, for, for further study or between countries for employment. If you're an employer looking to employ a, a plumber or electrician, how do you know that their qualifications are the sort of things, thought of things that you want? Um, it, it does this by using frameworks like the CQFW to make learning visible, making what qualifications contain, what level they're at, um, more understandable to two different people. Um, and what the EU has done is it's, it's supported the development of 
a variety of different tools and programs to encourage and support mobility, which could be of use to admissions tutors, to employers, to people who want to move and increase their learning opportunities, people who want to go and work in different areas, as well as to people like people like careers advisors. So if we move on um, to say that as far as the European Union is concerned at the moment, there are a number of important tools, some of which Emma's, Emma's already touched on. There's something called the European Qualifications Framework, which is a way of mapping qualifications showing size and level, which operates on the same principles as the CQFW. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the mo at a moment, in, in a moment. There's also something called Europass, which is an international CV. Um, and again, that's going to be explained later on in, in, these, in these presentations. Emma mentioned European credit transfer. Now this is where achievement of, of learners across different countries and bet uh, between different institutions um, is, is easier if people can have, can carry recognition of the credit they've achieved, the qualifications that they've got. Um, and ECVET, European Credit Transfer, applies if learners move between different countries if they have a work placement in a different country, if they have learning in a different country, they can do a qualification or a part of a qualification and they can carry, carry this with them in different, uh, to different institutions. This is good for people who are doing study visits, people who have work experience abroad. It's also useful for higher education to make it more accessible and inclusive. It means that you can move between different countries and different institutions more easily. And it makes what we do in this country more attractive worldwide because people aren't stuck with, with one institution. Then there's European quality assurance, which is where different countries are lining up their quality assurance processes. So that somebody who is, comes from another country to a, an employer in the UK or a university or college in the UK, we can be sure that the quality assurance that they have received is as good as we would, we would expect. So we can, we can be confident that their degree or their qualification is as as you know as as good as it, it it needs it needs to be. Emma mentioned uh, non formal and in, informal learning, lifelong learning. There's a lot of this going on. People don't just do standard qualifications. People do uh, work based and um, employer design training training courses. And there's a big push across Europe to recognize this learning because very often this will contribute to a more formal qualification. And the idea is that there is no reason to make people learn things twice just because you know, they want to do a formal qualification. If you've done some learning with an employer, or you have got a lot of experience because you've been working for a long time, even though you've never actually taken a formal exam, then this should be, this should be recognized. And there's something called recognition of prior learning, which is a process common now across most countries in the world, which is recognizing this um, is particularly for people who have been in employment 
maybe wished, you know, maybe because they've been made redundant or maybe they just wish to change jobs. Changing jobs, they need a qualification. They don't want to do, they don't want to start back at the beginning again. And recognition of prior learning is a way of trying to recognize what they've all, what they've already got. The EU also funds the Erasmus programme called, called Erasmus Plus. Um, one of the things Erasmus does is it supports visits, uh, study visits and work placements across countries, sometimes a short two week visit, sometimes longer term work placements, often based with apprenticeships. Um, it also promotes things like visits by members of staff of institutions um, across Europe. Um, Erasmus ties in with Europass, ECFET and European, European Quality Assurance because all of these tools and programmes complement each other and, and try to enhance understanding and mobility across, across Europe. Okay. The main tool that everybody uses across Europe is something called the European Qualifications Framework. It's a framework like the CQFW for describing qualifications, a currency, if you, if you like. It's what's called a meta framework. In other words, there are no such things as European qualifications. Every country has got its own set of qualifications, whether that's the UK with its A-levels and its B-techs, or it's France with things like the baccalaureate. Similarly, Germany, Italy, Spain, everybody's got its own, its own qualification. But what the EQF does is it asks the member states to define their qualifications in the same way, so that we're all speaking the same language, go back to the idea of, of the, same, the same currency. And there are three principal uh, ideas within the EQF. One is that all qualifications are defined in terms of learning outcomes. That is that they must say that at the end of this unit or at the end of this qualification, the learner will be able to either know, understand, or do something. So they will know how to wire a plug, or they will understand principles of electricity, or they will be able to wire a plug, or whatever it happens to be. Secondly, qualifications are defined in terms of size. Size is based on credit, and credit is, well, one credit is 10 hours of learning time for the average learner. And what that involves is simply decided by consensus, by, by experts who understand qualifications learning, saying this piece of learning is worth one credit, five credits, 10 credits, 100 credits. Um, the time taken includes time for teaching, time for self-study, and also time for assessment. Finally, qualifications are defined in terms of levels. Um, and so a, each qualification and each part of a qualification is given a level similar to the CQFW diagram. Levels go from one to eight, where eight is the top. It's equivalent to a doctorate qualification. Uh, level six is an honours degree. Level three is equivalent to our A-levels or BTEC nationals and uh, goes down to level one, which is pre-GCSE pre pre level and, and may include uh, people with special, special educational needs. Okay. Let's have a look at some of these frameworks. What I've got here are the main frameworks in operation 
in the UK. Um, what we've got on the left hand side is something called the regulated qualifications framework, which is the main one for A levels and GCSEs. Next, we've got the framework for higher education, which is used by universities and, and higher education institutions to give a level to their qualifications. EQF, I'll skip over at the moment. Then we've got the CQFW. We've also got the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework. And because we work very closely with the Republic of Ireland, we've also got uh, the National Framework for Ireland. Now, you will notice that the numbers do not align exactly. And that is because um, each country has got its own qualifications and its own particular structure. And while they're broadly similar, there are some differences. And this means that uh, each country has got to decide on its own numbering system. You will see that uh, the regulated qualifications framework, which is principally England and Northern Ireland, although Wales uh, works with that as well, um, aligns very closely with the EQF. There are some slight differences around levels, levels four and five. Um, Scotland and Ireland have got different systems, uh, different numbering systems, um, because of, uh, particularly in Scotland, of the nature of their qualifications, a different structure to that in England, Northern Ireland and Wales. But what it's saying is that in Scotland, um, a level, a degree qualification would be at either 10 or 9, and that's equivalent to level 6 in the EQF, and similarly, a level 6 on the CQFW and a level 6 on, uh, on the RQF. In Ireland, the qualifications they label as 8 to 7 are equivalent to the level 6 in, in England, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So that's basically how the qualification comparison system actually, actually works. Okay, um, when you've got time, you can use this link to actually watch a short video on how the EQF actually works. Sorry, Lambus, you could edit this out. You'd, you, we can't show the video. It's, there's no point in showing the video, is there? It's okay, yeah. I mean, it, it, for the purposes of time, it's probably better just to carry on. Fine, okay. Right, sorry. Um, the EQF has a website which individuals and organizations can use to compare qualifications in different countries. If you search for learning opportunities and qualifications in Europe, you will, you will be able, you'll be able to find, you'll be able to find this. What I've given here is an example of what that website will do at the top level. You can pick any countries, mainly any two countries. What you will then get is a, um, a list of the main qualifications at the different levels in those countries and then compare them against the EQF. So if you wanted to, if you were in, in Malta and you wanted to compare your qualifications with, some, with, with what happens in France, then you could say, okay, in Malta, we've got an undergraduate diploma, which is equivalent to all of these certifications which are part of the French system, all of which are roughly equi or approximately equivalent to EQF, EQF level five. What every country does is it produces a referencing report, which is a detailed guide to the qualifications in that country. 
So if you want to know a lot about a qualification system, you can go, you can, you can look that up, as well as comparing levels. And it gives you all the information you need. Um, because qualifications change over time, uh, referencing reports are updated. Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland have just produced new referencing reports, which have just been put onto the EQF website. So the information on the UK is, is bang up to date. Okay, because there's a lot of mobility between the four UK administrations and the Republic of Ireland, but each one of those has got its own education, education system. There's been a lot of work done to ensure that mobility across the UK and between the UK and the Republic of Ireland is as barrier free as possible. And this will continue whatever the outcomes of Brexit. There's, you know, the Irish government and the UK government have said they want to ensure they are, they are no, there are no barriers. And what the administrations have done is produced a, a fairly detailed guide, but at the same time, easy to follow guide, comparing qualifications between the five, the five countries. And you've got, um, on this page of the, of the, of, of the document, it is, a, it is a comparison to the frameworks, similar to the, the diagram we saw before. Um, there's also a more detailed explanation of uh, higher education qualifications and also a, 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 an explanation of apprenticeship frameworks. And then on this page, there is a, uh, again, a more detailed comparison of the frameworks across the five countries, with the left-hand column saying roughly what type of educational qualification it is, and then in the white boxes, a detailed description of where the levels are. As you can see, there is some differentiation in the numbers and also some slight differentiation in the levels, but broadly the qualifications compare. So again, if we go to uh, level three, for example, then um, that is vocational, things like BTECs, GCSEs, sorry, GCSEA levels, um, the Welsh back in Wales, or a, a level five leaving certificate in Ireland, and uh, apprenticeships and some Scottish, and, and the Scottish baccalaureate qualifications in Scotland are all, are all roughly comparable. Okay. And you can find a link to that document on that um, on this link here. The document is updated regularly. Again, there has just been an update because qualification systems are changing. So you do need to get the most up to date one of these one of these that you that you can. Okay, so just to to sum up. Um, the EQF can be used using the different tools to compare your qualifications with somebody else with, with qualifications at the same level in another country. If you're receiving people from another country, you can find out how their qualifications compare to the UK's qualifications. And if you've got clients who want to go to other countries, you can actually say, this is what your qualification is equivalent to there. And as I've said, anybody concerned with mobility, 
employers, admission staff, careers advisors. Um, you can investigate jobs and courses that can be accessed with UK, UK qualifications. What, quali what um, Colleges Wales has done is it has produced a, a website called Skills for Europe which has got a lot of case studies of people using these qualifications. And there are lots of practical examples of how the tools can be used. We've also taken some frequently asked questions and provided answers with links to the tools that you can actually use. The link for the website is given, is given there. And again, it's something you can, you can explore in your own time. Okay, and here's an example of the, of the question. So are you recruiting people and workers from Europe? Are you looking to study abroad? Um, and there are other, other questions uh, like, like that. And here are some questions that people might ask. I've seen an advert for a job. I've been in a work placement in Spain. How can you use them? And so you can see, you can see there, um, how the how the website might be of, of practical use to you. Okay, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll now pass on to Lambros at uh, at, at Narik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so I'm Lambros Pardale, um, I'm the coordinator of the UK National Europass Centre, which is housed within UK NARIC. Um, I'll just go quickly through what I'll be covering today. So primarily I'll cover the, the role of UK NARIC in international and UK qualification and skills recognition, um, the role of Europass and how it assists um, international mobility of individuals, um, what's, and also what's coming for the future. So development of the new Europass. So what does UK NARIC actually do? Um, UK NARIC is the designated national agency for the recognition and comparison of international qualifications and skills to a UK standard. UK NARIC is contracted by the UK government to perform this role. Um, so within this capacity, UK NARIC provides advice on UK qualifications internationally to our, to our members as well, which includes universities, awarding bodies, um, vocational, educational, vocational education and training institutions, government departments, and, and a few more as well. Um, also, UK NARIC houses the UK National Europass Centre. So it's important to understand also how qualification frameworks assist with this um, task of credential evaluation. I won't go into too much detail since um, Adrian has already covered, um, especially this document, the qualifications could can cross boundaries um, within a UK context, but it allows us to understand where a qualification sits in a national context and therefore how it relates, compares to a wider context across borders. Qualification frameworks are often based on other qualification frameworks especially with reference, that's how you know, development of the, the EQF, for instance, has, has, been, has happened. So therefore, qualification frameworks are a very useful tool for comparisons and benchmarking of international qualifications and helps us to advise our members on UK qualifications, um, as, as, I, as I mentioned as well. And also links in closely to the um, the work um, for the, the CQFW has, has undertaken and contextualizes that information within, within a UK setting. And then you have a slightly more detailed picture as, as Adrian has, has, already, has already gone through with us. So, as mentioned, Europass is housed in UK NARIC, so it's, import, it's important to understand what its role is within this context. Primarily, it's important to understand what Europass actually is. So Europass is a set of five free standardized documents that helps individuals take advantage of work and study opportunities across Europe and beyond. The initiative is free because it's co-funded by the European Commission and by our own Department for Education. 
The most well known of these documents is the Europass CV, but all of the documents collectively have been completed over 200 million times, meaning that it's been arguably the most successful European Commission initiative since its launch in 2005. Um, and the overall aim of Europass is the transparency of skills and competencies for mobile citizens. So I think it's also good to understand how Europass helps within these recognition practices, um, primarily by two of the documents within the five overall documents within the Europass portfolio. Um, and they are called the Certificate Supplement and the Deployment Supplement. So firstly, the Europass Certificate Supplement is issued to holders of vocational training certificates. Usually there is a national database of these, which is freely available to access by, by anyone. Um, in the UK, when issued, they are usually issued by a warding body since we have a, a slightly different um, model. Um, but it's important to note that this is not a substitute for the original certificate or does it guarantee automatic recognition. However, it does go beyond the traditional transcript, which usually just denotes an individual's achievement. There's information about progression, further study, um, learning outcomes, um, links to national qualification frameworks or the European qualification framework, and therefore helps to guide and inform those who receive the document, either as an individual um, to understand what um, they've actually achieved, or for employers and education providers when evaluating an individual's achievements. And here we have an example of a Europass certificate supplement. This is a Greek um, example. And as you can see, all the additional information provided, with, which can be very useful from a recognition perspective and, and therefore NARIC perspective. Um, and as you can see, the, the European qualification framework level is, is highlighted. The second Europass document, which, which is helpful for these these practices is the diploma supplement which is issued alongside higher education qualifications um, again it, it goes beyond the traditional university transcript which will just show the scores achieved um, for each course or module um, but it will show information about um, what the individual has needed to enter upon a, a course what they can do after that um, and again list learning outcomes It also assists in the same sort of manner of recognizing and understanding a qualification that's been obtained. It's very similarly to the certificate supplement and, and also sometimes does show professional rights within, within the country of study, for instance, uh, teaching rights. And here we have an example of a Spanish diploma supplement on the left, which again mentions, um, references the, the EQF, of the level, um, EQF level of the qualification obtained. Um, and also the right hand side shows the very last page of what all di diploma supplements have, which is details of the national qualification framework. Um, so here's an example of a, a Portuguese national qualification system, taking us through from the, the very lowest level all the way to the highest. So within the UK, we have a slightly different version of the diploma supplement. The Higher Education Achievement Report, which was launched in 2007, was developed just after the diploma supplement was initially launched in 2005 with the other Europass documents. It is essentially a UK version of the diploma supplement, but with a few notable differences. In 2012, it here was recognised by the European Commission as a diploma supplement. So here are the notable differences. Firstly, that it is available from the beginning of a student's study um, and it can be accessed at any time they, they wish to view it. Um, further to this, section 6.1 over here accounts for non-formal attainment during an individual's um, study period. This experience is verified and helps to show any additional skills which have been obtained um, while studying, for instance, um, work experience or voluntary work. Um, So, 
where does that leave us moving forward? Um, as I mentioned, there are a few very noticeable difference, uh, notable differences coming um, for, for Europass. Um, so next year, there'll be a two-phase launch of a new Europass platform um, in spring 2020 for a phase one launch and at the end of 2020 for a phase two launch. Um, and this is organized in four main strands as follows. So firstly, we have the Europass ePortfolio, which will enable users to display, document, and share their skills, qualifications, and experience gathered in the course of every stage of their life. Um, and this, for, this ePortfolio will include three main sections, um, divided as My Europass, Work in Europe, and also Learn in Europe. Um, and this will be a central hub that offers individuals tools to be able to create a profile, match the skills um, for further study or work. This is obviously closely linked to the next strand, which is um, information on work and learning opportunities. Um, relatively self-explanatory from the name, but it's important to note that this section of the platform will also include links to other European services and tools. Um, opportunities for validation of non-formal and informal learning, um, what an individual needs to do for um, to undergo recognition practice when being mobile across Europe. Um, so it promises to be another hub of, of very useful information that links out to the other services which, which Adrian mentioned um, previously. Thirdly, there's the Europass interoperability strand. Essentially, this will be the ability of, of any system to work within, work with um, the Europass system without restriction or limitations in order to make um, completing of information and linking out to other systems as easy as possible for individuals. And um, for instance, this may be linking to other um, job boards for the purposes of finding jobs or linking to national databases for the purposes of further study. Um, a good example is, for instance, the, the European Employment Service. So someone will be able to link their, their Europass profile to there for the purposes of, of finding um, um, work opportunities. And finally, there's the framework for digitally signed credentials. Um, a digitally signed credential are, is um, an electronic record given to a person to certify the learning they've received. Um, such learning includes formal education, training, online courses, volunteering experiences, and more. Um, and within this platform, individuals will be able to store the credentials that they've earned, and the organizations will, will also be able to issue secure, verified documents to individuals, either linking them immediately to their Europass profile or sending them out to whichever profile they, they wish to save it as. And this can also then be shared by an individual and then immediately verified by employers or institutions um, when, when receiving them. So just to offer a few concluding remarks, the development of the new Europass is, is exciting. And for the time being, we're still part of this innovation. Um, most importantly, the focus is, is on giving the individual control over their information and what they choose to do with it. Um, if you would like any further information about this, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, I've only really scratched the surface of um, the functionalities which have been proposed. Um, further to this, um, Nadrian did already mention the situation concerning Brexit. Um, Brexit. Um, but it's important to note that mobility will not end. Whilst there may be some, some barriers um, in place, um, more so than what we've been used to currently, there is, there is still going to be mobility across um, Europe for individuals. The funding for initiatives like Europass, <clears throat> for Europass and the other ones, um, such as the EQF, Euroguidance, et cetera, um, will still continue in a, a European-wide framework. And this information is, is, 